Take a step into the unknown and experience the best in horror storytelling. Support my podcast on Patreon and receive early access to all my episodes and a vast archive of over 50 bonus episodes. The car suspension squeaked loudly, and my wife gasped as we went over a boulder which was embedded in the grassy road, scraping the car's undercarriage. Jagged chunks of rock were everywhere along this stretch, looking as if they could pop a tire if we went over them too quickly. The road had been more than a little bumpy, but the cabin wasn't far off. According to our directions, it was only another half mile or so, and I had already caught glimpses of the lake through the trees. I felt like leaving a complaint on the Airbnb account we had rented this cottage from, and we hadn't even gotten there yet. The directions had been atrocious, and this hardly even seemed like a road anymore. The pavement had turned to gravel a long way back, and after that, it had become hard-packed dirt, then grass, with two barely visible tire ruts being the only indication of a road. At least we saw a few cottages, indicating that we were on the right path. We came around a sharp bend and suddenly had to slam hard on the brakes. There was a woman standing in the middle of the road. She was in her 60s or 70s by the looks of her. Her graying hair hung down over most of her face, only one eye visible behind the knotted strands. She stood in the middle of the grassy roadway and stared at us through the twisted net of hair. Normally, people in cottage country would wave and maybe even flag down a car like ours to say hello, since there were very few people around. But instead, she just stared at us, her head slightly tilted as if thinking. She made a very slow and wide sidestep to her right, turned on her heel, and walked away into the forest. Once she was in the trees, she disappeared completely. There was something very creepy about this. We were in the middle of nowhere, for one thing, and for another, there was no path where the woman had entered the forest. She had just seemingly wandered away into the wilderness. Her appearance had been startling as well, her blue dress looking dirty and slightly ragged, belonging to a wardrobe from half a century ago. And not to mention that hair, covering her face like the girl from The Ring, I shuddered, feeling like a cold draft was coming from somewhere, but both the windows were closed to keep mosquitoes out of the car. What the hell? Christine muttered from beside me. Who was that? I didn't quite know what to say. Part of me wanted to turn around and go straight back the way we'd come. This peculiar stranger in the middle of the wilderness seemed like a very bad omen, but another part of me was saying that was ridiculous. We'd made a long drive to get here, and it wasn't necessary to leave just because we saw a random person in the road, probably in the midst of a mental health crisis. Or maybe she was just an eccentric, a hermit who lived alone in the forest, isolated from everyone. I don't know, I answered. Maybe she's just shy. My wife didn't sound reassured by this, but it was the only thing I could think of. The woman didn't look dangerous, just a bit off. Hopefully she wouldn't bother us. I continued driving and came to a steep hill going upwards. Gunning the engine, I kicked up rocks and dirt as the tires spun on the slick mud, bouncing through potholes, the undercarriage dinging against the occasional rock or fallen branch. There was an old, dilapidated red cottage up ahead on our left, and a fork in the road led toward it down a steep gravel driveway but the address wasn't right. Looks like our place should be the next one, I said, realizing the numbers were getting closer. The cabin looked empty, with no signs of life that I could see. It was in the general direction where the woman had walked through the trees, and I wondered briefly if she lived there. I mentioned this to Christine. Great, so the crazy lady is our neighbor, she said sarcastically. Very reassuring. The car rumbled over a few more large boulders, and I weaved side to side to avoid them. It was a bright, clear day, and when we emerged from the trees, I could see water all around us, except for a narrow strip of land which led onwards. We finally made it to the peninsula where the cabin was located. The peninsula was at least half a mile long, 
and we would have it all to ourselves. First, though, we had to make it down a very steep hill. A gut-churning precipice stood before us. Sharp rocks protruded from the dirt halfway down, and I would need to stay close to the trees to avoid them. Stop! My wife nearly screamed, causing me to hit the brakes. This can't possibly be the right way. Trust me, I said, taking a deep breath. This is the right place. The hill's probably not as steep as it looks. I got this. Before she could say another word, I put the car back into gear and drove forward. The nose of the vehicle dipped in a terrifying way, and Christine gasped as we plunged over the edge, as if going off a cliff. We rocketed downwards, my stomach rising like it would during the steep first drop of a roller coaster. The car was speeding rapidly down the slope, and I had no chance to avoid the rocks. I heard the undercarriage scrape loudly against the sharp stones, and the passenger side of the vehicle rose sharply for a second as we careened over a boulder. But then we finally leveled out sickeningly at the bottom, the front end nearly colliding with the grassy road. I hit the brakes and the car began to slow. Finally, I brought the vehicle to a halt, and we looked around to see we were almost completely surrounded by water. The engine was letting off a bit of steam, which was rising from the edges of the hood. I prayed it wouldn't burst into flames, leaving us stranded here. Holy shit, Christine gasped. I tried to stay cool, as if I hadn't almost shit my pants. The steaming mist from the engine died down, and I let out a deep breath. This must be it, I said. Look, at the water. It was on both sides of the car, only a foot away in the narrowest section. Lily pads and reeds stood beside us, and I saw frogs hopping in the grass. A heron took off nearby, its great wings flapping as it took to the sky, looking like a long, extinct dinosaur. I had to get out of the car to clear away a fallen branch as we got within sight of the cabin. Deer flies and mosquitoes assaulted me immediately. I was fighting them off with my baseball cap the whole time while moving the fallen tree branch. Several of them managed to sneak away with chunks of my flesh before I could swat them, and I yelped loudly when one deer fly bit the back of my neck, leaving a stinging welt. Finally, we pulled up outside the cabin, and I let out an exhausted breath as I put the car in park and let the engine die with a hissing rattle that didn't sound healthy. I got out of the car on wobbly legs, and the first thing I noticed was how silent it was this far away from the city. There was no background noise at all, just utter quiet. The soft sound of the waves lapping into the shore from the lake was the only thing that could be heard, and the occasional buzz of an insect droning past. It was a warm, calm evening in early summer, and it looked like we had the entire lake to ourselves. The two of us looked up at the place where we would be spending the weekend. It was a small, unremarkable box of a cabin with brown siding and a narrow wooden staircase leading up to a screen door at the front. To the right of the car was a boathouse, perched on tilted footings that looked ready to collapse at any second. That doesn't look safe, I said, pointing out the odd angle at which the secondary structure was sitting just beside us. At least the cabin was standing straight up and down, and it looked well secured from animals and the elements. A sturdy wooden door was behind the screen, and I opened it with a key contained in a nearby lockbox. At first, I thought it wouldn't open, as the key got stuck inside the lock, but eventually it turned with some effort. I opened the door, and it creaked loudly on its hinges. We stepped into the dusty cabin, and I brushed spiderwebs aside to walk down the entry hallway. There was a smell inside the place that hit me right away, like a punch to the face, a stink of death and decay. A dead mouse somewhere, maybe. No, it was worse than that, stronger. Ah, uh, what's that stink? Christine asked immediately, setting down her bags to hold her shirt over her face. I don't know. I answered. It smells like something died in here. It turned out I wasn't wrong. After opening every window and unpacking our belongings, we settled down onto the couch in the living area. 
The breeze from the lake was helping with the unpleasant odor, but it wasn't taking it away completely. It hung heavy in the air around us, and with it was that eerie feeling that something was off about this place. The smell of death and the strange woman on the road, all of it was so unsettling. We tried to distract ourselves by thinking of some activities to do, but it was difficult with the limited resources available. There were some dusty board games laying underneath a cabinet, but on inspection they were chewed up and filled with ancient mouse turds, missing most of their pieces, making them useless. It was too late to go swimming, it was too hot to light a fire in the indoor fireplace, and too buggy to light one outdoors. The place had no electricity or any real means of entertainment. All we could do was watch Netflix on the tiny screen of my phone, trying to ignore that stink of death coming from somewhere. The data signal kept going in and out, and eventually we put our phones away, giving up on entertainment altogether. I hope you brought a good book, I joked to Christine. I guess it's probably for the best anyways. It's not like we camp up here to watch Netflix. Yeah. Christine agreed. There's supposed to be a boat. Maybe we can take it out on the lake tomorrow. Sounds good. It's probably locked up in that boathouse that looks ready to fall over outside. Hopefully the boat is in decent shape at least. I was already picturing a rusted rowboat with cartoonishly large holes in its bottom. But I didn't say that out loud. Something about this weekend had to turn out right. The pictures on Airbnb had been very misleading, though. The two of us read a couple paperbacks for a while, lighting the kerosene lanterns to see once it was completely dark outside. It wasn't even 10 o'clock by the time Christine said she was ready for bed. The couch we were sitting on was a futon, so we unfolded it to make it into a bed. She laid down and closed her eyes, but I wasn't quite ready to go to sleep yet. I'm going to go out and look at the stars, I said. I'll be back in a few minutes. She nodded, already half asleep, and I made my way across the creaky floorboards of the cabin to the front door, opening the screen to let myself out into the cool night air. The breeze coming in off the lake was chilly, and we had closed the windows part way to avoid freezing throughout the night. The smell had begun to creep back in, even worse than before and it was nice to be away from it, breathing the fresh air off the lake. I looked up at the sky and saw it was a clear night, the slim sickle moon making it easy to see the stars. There were so many of them, far more than I'd ever seen in the city. I could make out the hazy stardust of the Milky Way and stared in awe at the infinity of twinkling lights that made up the dusty white streak of our galaxy in the sky. I tried to imagine our planet as it truly was, just an infinitely small speck floating in that massive, swirling saucer of milk that made up this cluster of stars we call home. A shooting star streaked across the sky, and I let out a soft gasp. It was so beautiful up here. It almost made me forget about the little things that had creeped me out about the place. The weird lady on the road and the smell in the cottage. Those things were momentarily forgotten as I gazed up at the sky in wonder, looking for constellations and picking out the ones I knew best. I'm not sure how long I stood out there for, staring at the stars, but it was long enough for me to begin to feel cold and for my eyes to adjust to the darkness. When I looked down at the area around the cottage again, I was surprised to see it was no longer pitch black. Due to my eyes adjusting, I could now see well enough to make out the vague details of the road leading away from the cabin. Fireflies lit up intermittently, glowing in the distance near and far. Then my eyes settled on something horrifying. Between the trees up ahead, I made out the dark silhouette of a person standing in the road, about 50 yards away. I was so startled that I let out a strangled noise that was halfway between a gasp and a groan. My heart was hammering as I looked at that shape, trying to tell myself I wasn't seeing it, that it couldn't be real, that it couldn't be a person. But then the dark form took a step into the trees and there was no longer any way to deny it. 
I was about to turn around to run when I heard a sound to my right. A twig snapping underfoot as someone moved in the undergrowth of the forest. Trees stood on either side of me, and I looked to see another figure standing there amongst their trunks. This one only 10 or 15 yards away. They moved when I glanced over, to hide behind the bulk of a tree. Then, there was another sound to my left, someone shifting on their feet in the forest. There were more of them. Too scared to move or think, I just stood there, frozen. I had heard of the deer in the headlights phenomenon, but I had never experienced it for myself. The sheer terror of being frozen in place as death moves toward you. One of those shadows popped out from behind a tree again, as if looking at me, and this time it didn't try to hide. It emerged and started coming toward me. The details of its face became more visible as it came out from the trees, stalking my way, boots crunching over dead leaves and twigs. Finally, I came to my senses and began running for the front door of the cabin. I heard footsteps coming from behind me, but was too terrified to look back. The soft glow of light from the kerosene lamps shone through the screen door, and I tried not to trip as I raced up the stairs and fought to open it. At first, the weather-beaten handle didn't want to function, as I tried desperately to turn it. I slammed my fist against the rusted button again and again to no avail. Finally, I slammed my palm against it and felt it give way. The door swung open towards me, and I nearly fell off the narrow porch as I stepped around it to go inside. I pulled it shut and locked the glass to see three figures approaching, two of them holding long blades in their hands. One of them looked like a sickle, in the same shape as the slim moon above, the sort of tool you would use to harvest wheat in the days before modern technology. The person wielding that blade let it scrape across the car's paint as they approached, and the high-pitched screech of it echoed in the still night air. There was no way to make out their faces, but I got the impression at least two of them were men, their forms large and looming. But the third person was a bit smaller, and I wondered if it might be a woman. Just before I slammed the wooden door shut, I saw they were wearing masks. A pig, a bird, and a wolf by the looks of them. The masks were simple plastic, like the ones that children wore at Halloween when I was a small child. Cheap, flimsy-looking things strapped around their heads with thin, elastic bands. They wore simple clothes, plaid flannel shirts and jeans with holes in the knees and dirty boots. All three of them walked slowly toward the front door of the cabin, as if in no particular hurry to murder us. I slammed the wooden door shut and threw the deadbolt closed, then spun around at the sound of movement behind me. Terrified, I almost hurled a blow at the person standing there, but then quickly realized it was my wife, Close the windows! There are people with knives outside! I screamed. Her face was white with shock, and she didn't move for a few long moments. Finally, she got moving and turned around, going to close the windows all around the cabin which we had opened to get rid of the smell. There was a sound of tapping on the glass behind me, and I looked to see a face peering in at me through the small window at the top of the wooden door. It wasn't big enough for the person to come through, just large enough for me to see their face. It was the person in the wolf mask looking at me. Their eyes were just dark, shadowy slits cut into the mask, and the overall effect was terrifying as they stared in at me through that window, holding up the knife. Is the back door locked? I yelled to Christine, patting down my pockets for my phone. It wasn't there. I locked them! She yelled back. Call 911! A window smashed at the back of the house, and I heard my wife scream. I ran back into the living area to see the large man wearing the pig mask was climbing in through the window he had just broken, and my wife was picking up a chair from the dining room to throw at him. She flung it across the room, and the chair legs shattered and splintered on impact as it hit the man, but he acted as if nothing had happened. A second later, I heard a loud noise coming from the front door. I turned around to see it flying from its hinges as it was kicked in by a heavy boot. Wolf mask came in and the one in the bird mask followed after him. I saw she was definitely a woman, judging by the looks of her. We were surrounded now. There were three of them, two holding knives and the smaller one carrying a pistol, blocking both ways out. For a moment, all five of us just stood there, breathing heavily, staring at each other. 
And then the man in the wolf mask spoke. We weren't going to hurt you, he said in a low voice. As long as you cooperate, put these on, now. He threw a set of handcuffs at me and another set at my wife. The woman in the bird mask had a gun in her hand and it was pointed at my face. She took a step closer, chambering around in the semi-automatic pistol as she did so, as if daring me to refuse. I put the handcuffs on and my wife did the same. The man threw a burlap sack at me and one at my wife. Put those on over your heads, he said. I hesitated, more terrified than I'd ever been in my life. The idea of being blind and helpless at the mercy of these three maniacs was more than I could take. Please, I said. We don't have much money. You can take the car, our credit cards, whatever you want. The woman came closer, her finger getting ready to squeeze the trigger. Put the fucking hoods on. She spit at me, not asking. This time I didn't argue. I reluctantly covered my head with a burlap sack and Christine did the same. Everything went dark and it was difficult to breathe with my head covered in the thick fabric. It was warm inside and humid with the heat of my heavy breathing. My heart pounded fast in my chest and my throat was bone dry. Now listen up, the man said. You two are gonna walk outside single file and then you're gonna get into the back seat of your car. Where are the keys? In my pants pocket, I managed to say. And a second later, there was a hand reaching for them and taking them out. That's all you need to worry about for now. Just walk to the car and sit down inside. Got it? I nodded and heard Christine mutter her agreement. Possibilities of what might be happening began to flood my mind as we marched outside to our vehicle. Everything from ritual sacrifice, cult initiation, and worse occurred to me as we were shoved roughly into the back seat of the car. The most likely scenario came to me last, and I realized with horror that it was probably what was happening. The way they were talking back and forth to each other and the no-nonsense way in which they were taking us from this place made it clear to me. It came to me with a shocking clarity. We were going to be sold. Human trafficking was a big business in the world, despite beliefs that slavery was a thing of the past. People are a valuable commodity, and once you are in bondage, it becomes very difficult to convince anyone that you belong elsewhere. Forced labor camps, factories, sweatshops, and sex rings where people are forced into prostitution. I had seen stories about these types of places on the news, but it wasn't talked about much. People didn't like to think about it. But these operations exist in almost every country in the world. Sons and daughters are taken from their families and are made to work for pimps as sex slaves or are crammed shoulder to shoulder into sweatshops in unseen basements, forced to sew clothing and shoes. And some people, like these folks who were taking us from the cabin, made a handsome profit by finding people for these operations. Maybe they were the ones who rented the cottage to us, or maybe they just knew we were going to be here. But I had a feeling it was the former, not the latter. Once we were in the back seat of the car, there wasn't much we could do but sit and wait. I thought the people holding us captive would start to drive the car away from the cabin, but they didn't. Instead, we just sat there sweating in the back of the vehicle, waiting for what felt like forever. I heard someone breathing in the front seat of the car and figured it was the woman. She was watching us while the two men did something inside the cottage. But what were they doing exactly? Finally, someone opened the car door and a gruff voice told us to get out. They marched us back up the steps through the front door of the cottage, and once we were inside again, I smelled the plastic. They pulled the hoods off our heads, and I saw the living space was now draped with tarps and clear plastic sheeting. They had converted the main living area of the cabin, making it into a kill room. Get on your knees, the man in the wolf mask said, and I saw he had the gun in his hand now. He was pointing it at our faces, and we did as he asked. You've been waiting a long time for this. You earned it. Are you ready? He asked the woman wearing the bird mask. She took a deep, trembling breath and said, I think so. Are you ready? He asked again, this time in a darker, more ominous tone. Yes, she answered back, this time sounding a little bit more sure of herself. Good, 
he said, turning to face the man in the pig mask. Give her the reaping blade. It is time for her to become one of the horde. He passed the long, curved blade that looked like a scythe, giving it to the woman. She took it in her hands and stepped forward, coming within arm's reach of us. She began to speak under her breath, the words sounding like a prayer or an incantation. Moving behind us, I felt the hair stand up on the back of my neck. She was still speaking in that low, terrifying voice, saying words I didn't understand in an ancient language long dead and lost to time. My thoughts were racing, images flashing in front of my eyes of good times and bad, cherished friends and loved ones. Everything went through my head in an instant as I tried to grapple with the reality that I was about to die in this cabin. And just as I felt the air move around my neck, indicating the scythe was settling in under my chin to do its work, there was a knock at the front door. A soft sound of knuckles tapping against the glass. Who is that? Pig Mask muttered under his breath. How the fuck should I know? Go look. Take the gun. Wolf Mask answered. He handed him the gun, and the man went to the front door, moving slowly, looking a bit nervous as he did so. The handcuffs were digging into my wrists painfully, and I tried to keep breathing. We were being granted a few more precious seconds of life. I wouldn't waste them. If there was some way we could get out of this, I would go for it. I wouldn't waste the opportunity if someone was trying to save us. Maybe it was the police, a voice in my mind said. Maybe someone heard the sound of the window breaking and they called the cops. There's a chance we could still survive this. There's nobody out there, Pig Mask called from the front door. Must have just been the whip. His voice cut out abruptly, and there was a loud noise from the front door. It sounded like an axe cutting into a very wet piece of wood. A second later, there was a piercing, high-pitched scream. I thought it sounded like a woman at first, but then heard Pig Mask's voice saying, You bitch! You fucking bitch! I'll fucking kill you! There was a sound of a gun being fired, over and over again. It echoed loudly through the cabin and made the man in the wolf mask run to the door. Watch them! He yelled at the woman, who was still holding the scythe around my neck. Move and you die, she said to me after he was gone. But I heard a quaking in her voice, indicating she was more scared than she was letting on. What happened? Oh, Jesus, Frank! What the fuck happened to your leg? I heard Wolf Mask saying from the front door. Pig Mask answered back, saying something incomprehensible. Take it. Take the gun. I'm fucking bleeding out here, man. Oh, God. I gotta get to a hospital. Shut up. Shut your mouth and keep quiet. She's still here somewhere. Where did she go? Christine and I didn't dare move as the woman held the blade at my throat, her hands shaking badly. Still, I was starting to feel more and more hopeful that we might get out of this. But who could possibly be outside doing all this? Was it a cop? I momentarily imagined some seasoned veteran who had been on the force for 30 years, hiding in the trees and taking them out one by one, like a lady version of John McClane. I just hoped she could stay alive long enough to finish them off. It was quiet again for a few long minutes. There wasn't a single sound from outside. And then I heard another meaty thwack before dead silence again. The woman holding the blade at our necks began to look toward the door, moving away from us. Don't you fucking move, she said, holding the scythe out menacingly. The two of us nodded. Hey, you guys okay? She yelled. After a few moments, there was still no response. A tapping sound came from the back window, and she spun around, looking scared. There was no one looking in through the glass. All that could be seen was darkness outside. The other shattered window at the back of the cabin was letting in a howling rush of air. The cold breeze frigid like ice as it came in off the lake. But there was another sound coming through the window as well. A choked, strangled sound, like someone coughing up blood. John? The woman in the bird mask called out. Are you okay? There was no answer. You motherfuckers! She screamed at us. Who's out there? Tell me, one of your friends? Did someone follow you up here? She was coming closer to us, brandishing the scythe in her hands, looking ready to start swinging it. Are you cops? Is that it? Did you figure out what we were doing up here? Tell me, what did you do to him? The two of us just shook our heads, confused and unsure how to answer. Neither one of us knew what the hell was going on. Finally, she gave up on questioning us and ran outside, screaming bloody murder. 
a gunshot went off outside, and it was quiet again afterwards. The lake was still and peaceful once again. After what felt like hours, I stood to my feet, terrified of what I might encounter outside. I began to move handcuffed toward the front door of the cabin. Just outside, Pig Mask was cold and dead on the front porch, leaking an impossible amount of blood from a gaping leg wound. I found the handcuff keys in his pocket and removed the cuffs from my wife's wrists, struggling to do so with my hands still behind my back. She let me out of my restraints next, and we went down the wooden steps outside to survey the property, sneaking towards the back of the cabin as quietly as we could. Wolf Mask and Bird Mask were found out back, their bodies cold and leaking blood from horrifying wounds. They had both been attacked by someone with a hatchet, by the looks of it, but there was no sign of who could have done it. After a few minutes, the two of us went back inside and looked around at the plastic sheets draped on the walls. They had been very organized, whoever these people were. They had done this before. The smell of death and decay was stronger than ever, and I realized it was coming from the storage room. We went in there and saw a hatch leading down into a basement, beneath the cabin. It had been hidden beneath a shelf, but now it was wide open, letting out more of that terrible smell from whatever was concealed down there. I didn't want to look inside that dark, terrifying space, but I felt like I needed to. I needed some form of closure. I wanted to see what the fuck these people had been doing here, and what they almost did to us. Going down the ladder, I nearly vomited at the sight of all the dead, decaying bodies. There were dozens of them down there, hidden beneath the cabin. Each one had its throat slit, the faces frozen in masks of terror. There was a shrine at one end of the confined room, with candles surrounding it. Symbols were painted on the walls in blood, and a terrible, unholy aura could be felt down there. After a few moments, I'd had enough. I went back up the ladder, vomiting immediately once I was out of that horrible smell. Not that it was much better on ground level. We didn't know what to do after that. With the two of us alive and so many dead bodies on the property, it suddenly occurred to me that we could be blamed for this. The police could try to pin the murders on us. After all, there was no one else around. The mysterious person who had saved us was long gone, and I knew from experience that our story would not necessarily hold up in court. The two of us would likely be charged with a triple murder and would go to prison for the rest of our lives. So we did the only thing we could think to do. We dragged all three bodies down to the basement, leaving them with the rest of the corpses. We cleaned up the plastic sheeting, stuffing it down the hidden trap door as well. We covered the hatch with a shelf, just as it had been when we arrived. And then we packed up our things and got in the car and drove away. By this point, it was morning. The sun was just beginning to rise over the lake. It was a beautiful view, but we didn't stay to admire it. We were cutting our weekend at the lake short, but for good reasons. As much as we'd been looking forward to getting away from it all, I'd be a million times happier now being home again. There's nothing like almost dying to make you appreciate what you have in life, let me tell you. I gunned the engine up the big hill, and we drove past the rusty red cottage down the lane, where the old woman lived who we had seen on the way in. As we drove past her cottage, we saw she was outside doing chores. She looked up from what she was doing and waved at us with a red-stained hand. She was washing the blood from her clothes, using a basin of water from the lake. After getting the stain out of the ragged blue dress, she hung it up on the line to dry, and then went back to chopping firewood. She swung the axe down hard on a block of wood, splitting it in two. A second later, the hatchet was up in the air again, and she was bringing it down on another log, splitting it in one swing. I was reminded again not to judge a book by its cover. The woman had looked crazy, and we'd mocked her and teased her for the way she lived out here a hermit, alone on the lake. But she had saved our lives. She must have suspected something was off with her neighbors running the Airbnb and decided to intervene. The old woman was scrawny, but she was stronger than she looked. Living on the lake with its chilly breezes, chopping firewood to stay warm for so many years, she had really learned how to swing a hatchet. 
and thank God for that. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.